good morning and welcome to the Goulburn Broken CMA online workshop with our presenter, Dr. Cassandra Schaaf from AgriScience Pty Ltd. Cassandra will be presenting to you to a, to you on a project funded by the Commonwealth Government National Land Care Program uh, and run by Riverine Plains. Workshop is called Baseline Baselining Soil Organic Carbon and pH in the Northeast. The session will be recorded as I mentioned and will be available on the Golden Broken CMA website in a few days time. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, past, present and future of the land we are all sitting on today. We have 44 people registered for today's workshop and so far we have 15 online. Um, if you have any questions for the presenter, uh, please put them into the chat box, which is the circle with lines through it up the top of your, top of your or the bottom of your screen, depending on what screen stuff you have. Um, and we'll answer your questions at the end of the presentation session. Please make sure your microphones are on mute and your cameras are turned off. This helps with people who have got bad bandwidth um, for their um, internet bandwidth. Um, I have put an evaluation form in the chat box already. Um, so please take a few minutes and fill that out before you leave us today. This enables us to report adequately to the Commonwealth Government, but also gives us some guiding, guiding um, principles or guiding suggestions going forward for future workshops. Um, so I'll hand over to Cassandra now to give her hour long presentation approximately. And, and we'll answer questions at the end. Please put them in the chat boxes, as I said. I'll hand over to you now, Cass. Thank you. Good morning, Karen. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to work with Golden Broken. And um, yes, yeah, it's, it's been a, a really good project to be involved in. And yeah, so thanks for the opportunity to talk through it today. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, got got quite a bit that I'd like to get through today. If there's ever um, anything that's not clear or, or we need a bit more um, going through it, then um, just make a note of that and we can talk through more at the end and see how we go. Okay, let's see if we can, if we can share. And uh, just give me a sec. All right, so this project was all around um, quantifying the variability of soil organic carbon and pH, um, particularly within in paddock scale. So it was really around um, what's happening in our paddocks in the northeast and how we can quantify what's going on. This is a bit of a, an overview of the, of the partners in this project. Uh, it was the Golden Broken CMA investment was part of a larger investment of work, which is partnered with the Northeast CMA um, in partnership with River and Plains and support from Mars Pet Care, um, who internationally are, are very much involved in sustainable farming and, and how to source their grain sustainably. This was also supported by the Sustainable Food Lab, which is a not-for-profit organisation based in the US, and they provided some of the, uh, the technical support around the um, the measurements that we were doing. So just a bit of context to this work. Um, the project that, that we ran with Golden Morgan CMA and North East CMA um, was part of a larger piece of work that was all around collecting farm input data for wheat production with the aim to estimate on-farm greenhouse gas emissions. So this was part of a supply chain project to understand the role of on-farm emissions in food manufacturing, hence the partnership with Mars Pet Care, and how the private sector can support reductions in on-farm greenhouse gas emissions. The idea being that this, this is done in partnership with the farming community rather than any form of um, direct influence. So this research is ongoing and is part of the Cool Soil Initiative, which I'll flag at the end. So just to put some context as well around why we did the work, there were two drivers for why we wanted to look at this impact variability. So international modelling of on-farm greenhouse gas emissions predicts that when we convert a pasture paddock to cropping, we'll incur a significant greenhouse gas penalty due to the loss of soil organic carbon as, as CO2. Um, the, this is quite a massive penalty in the emission calculations 
and we wanted to, to check to see if that made sense for us, knowing that the greenhouse gas emission data that we're doing on farm, um, this information played a big role in understanding the magnitude of those emissions. So this was really just some snapshot sampling as a starting point to see what we thought we were starting with. And then as we as we learned from that, we then build up to, to do more targeted sampling over time. The assumption with this work is that paddocks coming out of pasture, and when we talk about coming out of pasture, we're talking about generally pasture phasing. So we're going in and out of pastures within the rotation. The assumption is that these paddocks coming out of pasture will have higher um, soil organic carbon values than those that are continuously cropped. And the other assumption is that these soil carbon values will decline rapidly once pasture paddocks go into cropping. So the second incentive to do the work was that the Emission Reduction Fund and the Carbon Farming Initiative, CFI, um, being the, the federal government's uh, contribution to the carbon trading landscape, is highly topical at the moment. Um, but there's a lot of, there's very little on ground info regarding the detail of the methods involved and the types of carbon stock values in terms of tonnes of carbon per hectare that we're likely to achieve for this region and also in terms of what that increase, any increases look like. So as part of this work, we were planning on doing some intensive soil organic carbon sampling anyway to answer our questions around the importance of the pasture phase in soil organic carbon dynamics in mixed farming systems. So I thought if we're going to do it anyway, let's do it according to the CFI methods so we can get the data that we need, plus the experience of going through the process and generating some regionally relevant examples around um, what the numbers look like and what the um, magnitude of increases then look like as well. So what do we do with this work? We selected four pairs of paddocks in northeast Victoria. It wasn't a long-term replicated trial or set up in any way for statistical comparison between, between paddocks. It was really a, a starting point from which we can then monitor over time. So each pair consisted of one continuous crop paddock and one pasture paddock that was about to be converted into cropping. These paddocks were located in Springhurst. Uh, we had two pairs of paddocks at Yarrawonga and one pair of paddocks down at Yarrawa. The idea of this was trying to capture some variants within the region and also to see if there were any differences according to, um, I guess, the microclimate, knowing that as we head south, generally the rainfall um, is a, lot, a bit more predictable. The sampling plan with this is that we use satellite imagery to collect the spectral data for each paddocks. So using radiometrics and NDVI data, which is our, what we call the greenness index, we then used a technique called Latin hypercube analysis. And this picked up the range of variation in soil types or in, in, in paddock um, reflectance in these spectral properties. And then we assigned 20 zones per paddock. Then we, this then generated a GPS located sampling point within each zone. And these were then sampled by soil sampling. So just flagging according to the strict CFI methods, the diameter of the soil core that we're supposed to use is about 3.8 centimetres, but this wasn't available to us at the time. So we took two cores at each sampling point with a smaller core diameter. We took our core samples from 0 to 10, 10 to 20, and 20 to 30 centimetres depth, and then we estimated the bulk density based on our soil mass and core volume. These samples were then sent to EAL Labs, Environmental Analysis Laboratories in Lismore, and they were analysed per the CFI methods, which includes measuring the gravel fraction. These sites were then actually have just been resampled in the last few weeks um, at the same points. Uh, we don't have the data from that yet, and then they'll be sampled again at least next year, if not continuing in time. So the idea was to get some good baseline information to see what our paddocks look like and what our variants in carbon stocks and pHs might, might be, and then we can track those over time. So just as some examples around the sampling plan that was used and where the sampling points were. So we actually can see the, um, the, the different zones that were allocated throughout the paddock and the sampling points within those zones. So it's worth flagging here just what the calculations are that convert soil organic carbon values in percentage through to what their tonnes per hectare measures are. And the key part, as I mentioned, is around adjustment for gravel. So we won't go through this in detail, 
just flagging that um, when we go from percentage, we then need to account the soil mass and how much gravel we have in the system and then um, converting that across. So, for example, if we have a 1.5% soil organic carbon value measured through this CFI methods, but we have 2% of our total soil volume is gravel, that then is corrected back to 1.47 um, soil organic carbon, including that gravel fraction. So this is really important and gets more important as we move into more gravelly type soils to ensure that we're actually generating the right tonnes per hectare of carbon within that total soil mass, not just the fine soil fraction. In terms of the average results that we got, if we think about it, how we, we would generally report these values, if we look at um, our pasture paddocks, which are in green, and our cropping paddocks, which are in red, we can see that generally there's not a lot of difference in our carbon values in that zero to 10 um, centimetre depth between the two systems. It was really only in the PW paddocks that we saw a, a, de a decline in carbon between the, uh, the pasture and the cropping. Um, but as I said, these are averages across 20 samples and we'll have a look at what that looks like in variability in a sec. So, but the key thing is just at a first blush, it doesn't look like there's a lot of difference between a pasture paddock and a, um, a long-term continuous crop paddock. <coughs> but the caveat with this is that um, we haven't accounted for the variation in biomass and plant species in our pastures. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get some really nice dense phalaris stands as part of our pasture species, um, pasture paddocks. So when we're really talking about the annual species within these pastures. When we convert those um, percentage values into stocks on a zero to 30 centimetre depth, this range from about 20 to about 27. A microphone on. It's all right, it was um, somebody else had just joined and they had their microphone on. I've just turned it off. Thanks. So what this shows us, um, first of all, um, it gives us an idea of what our carbon stocks per hectare actually look like in our systems. Um, there's a lot of talk around carbon in terms of tonnes per hectare at the moment. And so this starts to give us a bit of feel for what magnitude of values we're talking about. So again, there's a bit of variance within, within paddocks, but certainly within the same, within the same ballpark. So this is the existing tonnes per hectare of carbon. So this is not the carbon that can be traded or, or, um, or monetized in any way. So this is our background. So one thing we wanted to know, um, and we thought farmers and advisors would be interested in knowing as well, is how well our zero to 10 percentage carbon values align with our carbon stocks on a zero to 30 basis. So if we've got a zero to 10 number, can we kind of calculate an offset for that to go, okay, well, that's probably about, you know, 2% 2, 2 carbon is about 50 tonnes per hectare. We wanted to see how tight that relationship was. So there is a relationship, which you'd expect. Uh, it's not as tight as we would think because of the contribution of carbon at depth in these systems as well. And we can see that um, it looks like there's more variance in the cropping paddocks, which may be due to um, a greater contribution of carbon at depth. Whereas in the pasture paddocks, there would have been a lot more uh, residue and, uh, and fine roots on the surface. But this is something that we're following up with. So to look a bit at the variance in the values, which is what we were aiming to, to do with this work. This is uh, four of the paddocks that we were looking at, and we can just see with the differences in color according to each polygon there, how the different, how each paddock um, ranges in carbon values. So up in the top corner here, we, we go from 0 0.4 to 2.2% carbon in quite a small, small area. Um, across down the bottom here, uh, quite high values in some parts of the paddock, but still there's areas of 0.5% um, going up to 3.2. And again, in, in this paddock going from a, a low of 1.1 1.1 up to 3.3 percent carbon. So quite a, a lot of range within those paddocks. And if you look at some of the other, the four other paddocks that we we looked at, you can certainly see that there's there's a really strong range in those carbon values. They go from um, 0 0.8 to 
up to 1.6, um, you know, 0.5 to 2.3. So quite a strong range. Um, and the key thing, interesting thing here is these are all paddocks that visually look very uniform. So it's not, they weren't uh, defining land features or, um, or elevation changes in these paddocks. So look at them though, a classic Northeast Victorian flat cropping paddock, very uniform in appearance. So it really shows that um, our, vis our ability to visually detect difference uh, is a lot less than what it, we need to have to, to look at these kind of, um, this kind of information. So then uh, I mentioned that we sampled for pH as well. So when we look at um, our average soil pH within each paddock, we can certainly see that there's not just differences within each paddock um, or, and pairs of paddocks, but there's also differences of depth, which is really important. So just an example of how to read the, read the graph, the BS, this is the paddock that we labelled as BS. Uh, the green bar is the pasture and the red bar is the cropping paddocks. You can see, at, um, first of all, what is really interesting and is concerning is that there's a drop in pH um, on average in this paddock at this 10 to 20 zone. So that's starting to show that there's a, a vulnerability around subsoil acidity in this paddock. With uh, the TB paddocks, we get an increase in pH at depth, which is, is normal, is what we expect, and not much difference within the two, the cropping and the pasture paddocks. You see the same trend with the PW paddock and to some degree with the DP paddock as well. What we're also seeing is that with, uh, particularly with the PW paddock and the DP paddock, that there is some reduction in pH on average across the paddock that was cropped compared to that which was pasture. But unfortunately, as we, we can't do any stats between the two, we can't discern if this is actually a, a treatment induced effect, if it's due to the long term cultivation, so long term cropping, um, or if it's um, a natural shift. But we do know that as all agricultural systems are acidifying, that there's a high chance that the agricultural practice of cropping may have contributed to, the, to that soil acidification. And again, we looked at our variants within the um, within the paddocks and certainly we've got quite significant variants again like we saw with our soil carbons. So um, this paddock for example our top soils go from you know about 4.06 right up the way to above sixes and then some strong variants in our subsoil values as well. Uh, this was um, quite marked in some of the other paddocks and this you'll be able to have a recording of this presentation so you can look at it in detail. But certainly um, we can see that the, there's variance not just at the surface in terms of pH values but also at depth as well, which means that if you're looking to do any kind of um, spatial assessment of pH using um, pH mapping techniques, using some of the commercial providers of that service, um, it's always a great idea to when you're getting your soil surface pH mapped to ask for some um, incremental sampling down to depth as well to see what those pH measurements are like because that then means that you've got some baselines to see if soil acidification at depth is an issue for you. If it's not, that's fantastic. If it is, then it's something that you can start working towards. But if you don't have the information, then you can't make those decisions. Again, this is uh, the other paddocks just looking at their variance in, in soil pH at depth. So certainly knowing that when we um, average across the landscape in, in our pH values, just like our soil carbon values, that the numbers we get may not be very indicative of what our, our soil processes are actually doing. So as I flagged, uh, subsoil acidification is becoming a massive issue in North East Victoria. Uh, it wasn't in all of the paddocks that we sampled, but certainly some of them were showing some vulnerability towards that uh, acidity at depth. We need to look at GPS sampling at depth to look at this range of subsoil acidity, which is why if you're doing any um, spatial mapping of pH, then to look at those depth increments as well. And as I mentioned, if you haven't measured it and you don't have any numbers, then you can't manage it. So you don't know what you're dealing with, how bad the issue is and what you need to do about it. And definitely, um, certainly in our cropping systems and where possible in pasture phases, um, when you're going through a pasture renovation, for example, any applications of lime really need to be incorporated for them to have good value 
with the depth of that incorporation being highly soil type dependent. So when we look at the soil carbon and the pH information, um, there's certainly a very strong connection between the two. We know that soil pH is a key driver behind the soil's capacity to increase soil carbon. And we know that even though soil carbon can be retained under acidifying conditions, so if it was already high in organic matter and then pH decreased, that some of that organic matter is retained, but our ability to increase soil carbon under acid soils is highly limited. And this is really due to reduced microbial function and activity in our acid soils. And specifically, um, it's, we know that our rhizobium species are highly sensitive to acid soils. Um, I know there's some great developments at the moment around increasing um, new, uh, developing new strains of rhizobium that are more tolerant in acid systems. But as a general rule, um, we talk about pH of less than five in calcium chloride as being our threshold for rhizobium activity. So the key thing with this is even if your legumes can survive in acid soils, so you plant a loosened stand or another a legume or clover or pot, the rhizobium that um, um, are needed for the capture of atmospheric nitrogen with that legume, they can't survive. So you may find that the plant looks fine but when you pull it up, there's no nodules, which means that rather than fixing atmospheric nitrogen and so having a really great contribution towards soil fertility and nitrogen um, stores in the soil, that plant is actually just mining the soil nitrogen reserves just like any other crop species or plant species. So that's a, a really big thing to look at, particularly, um, particularly where you think that your legume or your pulse or you know, your loosen or whatever, it just isn't persisting as well as you think it should be. So the key thing is that if microbes can't function well, then they can't efficiently convert plant residues into soil organic matter. And this means that in part, and that means that we're getting very inefficient processes and we actually result in more um, greenhouse gas emissions through increased carbon moving back into CO2 because the microbes can't function properly and break it down in a really efficient way. So we find that in our pastures under acids, Acidification, our productive and deep rooted species are outcompeted by annual grasses and broadleaf weeds, which are less productive and have less biomass. This means that there's less recycling back to soil organic matter. And then in our cropping systems, our areas of low pH are also low in vigour and they have reduced biomass and yield. And we know that they're also subject to increased pest and disease pressures with greater weed burdens, um, which means that then we have reduced biomass turnover and again, we have less organic matter. So it's a key point in that um, we know um, through, through the research literature, there's no clear demonstration around the connection between acidity and increased pest disease and weed pressures. But anecdotally through the region, um, we know that where plants are exhibiting stress, um, then they're more susceptible to increase pests and disease. <clears throat> and generally, we know that they increase stress. It's a high, high chance that that may um, be due to subsoil acidification or even topsoil acidity in the absence of, of the obvious stresses such as water stress or frost. So we also know there's a positive relationship between productivity and soil organic matter potential. So what's good for our farming systems and good for getting great biomass growth uh, and production, that's also good for soil organic matter potential. So we talked about how, how we did our sampling and how, to, um, how we looked at this variation in soil carbon and pH across the paddock. So if we take our soil carbon values, for example, we just want to flag again the value of this GPS located sampling. So when we do our traditional transect sampling, which is what I was taught when I was at uni and most agronomists were as well, is that we collect soil from across a paddock and then we bulk all that soil together in the same bucket. Then we take a subsample of that out for analysis. So this means we get an average of the paddock, which is completely unrepresentative of any one part of the system that we're, we're looking at. So this means there's lots of inbuilt variance and error. So that also means because that value is so um, averaged, that anything that you do in that paddock to make change in soil carbon 
the chance of that being detected within this transect sampling is actually really low, which means that there's a chance that um, our systems may be performing better than what we expect, but the lack of any differences in soil carbon over time, maybe due to this transecting, just averaging everything out and blurring any of those changes. So in comparison, when we look at GPS located sampling, we're collecting soil from either one or several parts of the paddock and we're keeping them separate for analysis. So we're having taking, if we're taking two samples from the paddock, then they're getting analysed separately. And what we're looking at is even uh, finding out our low and our high parts or what we think might be our low and high parts and sampling them separately and then we can track changes in them over time. So how can we use our existing data sets to determine where we might be sampling in the paddock? So if farming these days um, just is abundant with, with data, um, although actually accessing that can be an issue sometimes. But things like um, pulling out your yield maps for your cropping paddocks. Um, if you know that that season there wasn't other issues such as frost, insects or waterlogging, for example, that might have caused differences in that yield. If you, knew that, if you know that that yield is representative of the, of the variance in the paddock, then that's something that you can use. If you have EM surveys, then that's a great resource that you can use to detect your and to identify your variance in the paddock to where to sample from. And the other thing that you can use is NDVI data. So um, this is, can be used for cropping and for grazing. There's some platforms now that offer free access to NDVI over the season. Um, but the key thing is that you need to find parts of the timing in the season where there hasn't been a lot of cloud cover. So really, you can go back historically through NDVI data and actually see which, which timing was, was good. Um, personally, I find that mid-September is a really nice time to look at variance in paddock. Is that where we should be getting our optimum growth? But the, the key with the NDVI data is all it's telling you is this part of the paddock is different to that part of the paddock. So you still need to just do a ground check to make sure that that difference isn't due to something else entirely. And always cross check your data quality and make sure that whatever you're using is, is um, appropriate. So I'd just like to flag um, the carbon credit units and the, the carbon, this is the carbon trading space. As part of this project, we went through the process and the activity of doing the sampling according to the CFI methods. And the premise of that was that why don't we take it through the process and see what, what it looks like and what can we learn about the actual process of if we were going to apply for credits, um, just to see what that looks like. So I've done some notes on this, um, as I found it's of general interest to farmers. So this is done based on all the literature and the, um, the methodology statements and the legislation, um, just and um, yeah, on the, the best information that we could we could come to hand. So just um, we'll just take a few minutes and go through this, and um, again you'll have these slides at the end in case there's something that you wanted to check out. So the key thing about when we apply for carbon credits or we want to do any sampling in that is that dollar value can only be attributed to new carbon. It's not your carbon that you've already got in the soil. It has to be a new carbon that you've, you've come above what you've currently got, which actually disadvantages really good farmers who already have really high values. So it has to be new carbon, and it also has to be um, attributed to doing something additional. So you can't just do what you currently do, even if that's best practice, you have to demonstrate that you're doing something new to then drive an increase in soil carbon. Once your baseline sampling is done, you then need to follow up that soil sampling within five year increments. And then the contracts for carbon credit units are generally between 25 and 100 years. Key thing to consider is that the, the credit, carbon credit units are based on CO2, carbon dioxide equivalents, not carbon values as such. So if the carbon credit unit is valued at $16 per tonne of CO2e, this equates to um, $4.36 um, per tonne of carbon. So it's, it's almost about a quarter. So the process that you'll go through, if you're interested in looking at this, 
was to define that area of land um, to be part of any consideration. So you don't have to say paddocks or farms, you can actually define just a discrete area. You then have to engage a qualified contractor to do the initial baseline sampling, and that's according to an approved sampling design. Now, when I last checked a few, um, about two months ago, I couldn't actually determine what a qualified contractor was. So I, I couldn't find information about what, what um, credentials or approvals or accreditation process were required to be qualified. You then need to develop a land management plan, and this is also with an independent contractor, and that's how you have to demonstrate your additionality. So what you're going to do different now compared to what you were doing beforehand. You then have to set up a practice change. Then you have to resample your soils within five years, which is called the first sampling period, and then pay for that independent audit of results. And the auditors are, um, say, KPMG, et cetera, so large auditing firms who just go through and check your, um, your quality of your data. So then if you get a measurable increase in soil carbon, you can apply for consideration into the Emission Reduction Fund, ERF option. Then you can choose to hold on to your carbon credit units or cash them in at the current option price. So we thought we'd just run a, an example scenario to say what does this look like in our systems? So if we've got a baseline starting carbon of 1.5% in our zero to 10, so this equates then to a total carbon stock of 30 tonnes of carbon per hectare. We then assume all our gravel and bulk density values are maintained. Then we say, well, what's the most that we could very optimistically kind of hope to achieve within five years? And we put 0.5% uh, as a target to say, well, that would be so, so high. What would be the value of doing something like that? So assuming that there's no change in carbon at any other depth, and we um, decided that we um, context this within a 25 year period. So we also assume diminishing returns with low additional carbon accrual over the remaining 20 years, knowing that we'll get most of our change with any difference in practice over the first, first while, and then that we start to level off from there. So we worked out, we thought, well, if we run through this calculation for the first sampling period of the first five years, then that would probably be the, the highest level of value that we get over that 25 year period per sampling time. So this increase in 0.5% results in an increase in an extra 6.18 tonnes of carbon per hectare. So then we thought, let's go through the process of calculating what this actually looks like. So 6.18 tonnes of carbon per hectare is equal to 22.63 tonnes of CO2 equivalents per hectare. You then need to, um, the first part of your calculations is actually to look at the last 10 years of paddock history and to try and calculate all your emissions that would have happened from that paddock within previous practice. So that includes looking at your, your stocking rates, looking at your nitrogen fertiliser, your fuel, lime usage, any other inputs that went into that paddock. So hopefully you've got really good records to pull out all that information. And then that's discounted off that 22.62 tonnes of CO2. So we haven't calculated that because we just couldn't work out the magnitude of what that might look like. And I couldn't even, I couldn't find any information on what the calculators or the methods were for doing those approximations. So, and rather than delve right into that stuff, we just wanted to flag that that's something that has to be considered. Then the, that tonne of, of 22.63 tonnes of CO2 equivalents minus your historical emissions, then gets a further discount of 5% to account for uncertainty for all um, for all projects, which brings it back to 21.5 tonnes of CO2. We then get another discount of 25% because we're only looking at a 25 year contract, not a 100 year contract, and that brings us to 15 tonnes. Then every soil carbon project has a discount of 50% from the first sampling period to the second sampling period. So it's not a 
and discount as such as it's a it's a deferral so it's kind of accredited for later and that's based on the huge uncertainty around um, measurements and demonstrating increases in soil carbon so that brings us down to 4.5 tons so then if we assume a carbon credit value of 16 tons that equates to 73 dollars per hectare then if we minus our ghg emissions over the five year sampling period so our greenhouse gas emissions over the period between our baseline sampling and our five year sampling which i also haven't calculated then you minus your carbon brokerage fee which can be up to 25 percent of the total value that brings us down to 54 dollars per hectare which is about $11 per hectare over those per year over those five years. So just flagging that those calculations haven't accounted for the historical or within period greenhouse gas emissions, and they also haven't taken into account all the costs for all the contractors and audit audits and everything that you need to do as well. So the caveats with this work is once this carbon credit unit is issued, the storage of that accumulated carbon is committed. So if anything happens to that land during that 25 year period, which results in a net loss of carbon, like drought, flood, fire, pest animals, anything else you can think of, then the farmer needs to pay back that loss. If the land is sold during the contracted period, the new owner has to either sign up to the committed contract or it must be paid out. The concern I have with this in our um, particularly in our cropping systems or our, our mixed farming systems, which need to be highly dynamic um, to account for seasonal variability and also um, management, um, you know, being able to respond to management issues, is that the, um, there's potential that responsible farm management decisions, like the incorporation of lime or strategic tillage to address herbicide resistant weeds, etc., are constrained due to this carbon management overlay, which then could potentially reduce your management options. It's kind of, it's kind of a really hard thing because you, you'd be concerned about doing any of those things because of your carbon value, but by not doing those things, you're actually potentially constraining the future productivity and sustainability of your farming land. So just flagging as well, um, into when we look at our soil carbon accrual in our systems, we know that sandy soils can hold less carbon than our clay soils because they've got less surface area and less exchange capacity, which means they have less chemical binding sites for that carbon to hold onto. We also know that our low pH soils retain less carbon, as I mentioned, because of lower microbial function. And we know that physically, um, constrained soils so that are crusted or dispersive or compacted, that require amelioration before they can build more carbon. So the key thing in any of those systems is you need to address your key um, system limitations before focusing on soil carbon accrual. So you can only build carbon up to your most limiting factor in your system. So you need to make sure that you've got all your, your large and macro uh, factors sorted before even considering carbon. We know that each soil has a threshold carbon capacity, so you just can't continue on in a linear increased fashion. We know that um, soils in tropical and subtropical regions can build more carbon due to moist and warm soils, and they have a higher biological ca capacity. So when we hear about some of the soil carbon values um, and the associated credits, etc., in, in the north, um, they're completely chalk and cheese to our systems. So uh, what can we learn from this? Um, we know that soil carbon is a very important part of our farming system and can contribute to our long-term soil health. At present, um, just from the snapshot that we've looked at, the dollar value of additional carbon um, is less, is much less than its value to the rest of the system. So we know that soil carbon is only one component of soil organic matter. So we know that just to maintain soil organic matter, we need lots of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur. Um, we know that organic matter by nature has very strict um, uh, ratios around different nutrients that are present within that matrix. So if we um, deplete our nutrients, so we're not um, bringing nitrogen back into the system through either rosabial 
um, and fixation or through through urea if we're not maintaining our soil phosphorus levels if we're not um, picking up our sulfur and our ph values we know that we can't maintain soil, soil organic matter so it's actually a, a cost to the system to maintain higher soil fertility because without that inherent soil fertility we can't maintain soil carbon so if we actually looked at the dollar value of all those nutrients and then looked at that um, compared to the payment of carbon if we were to um, cash in any you know, go for carbon credits or you know, any monetary um, commitments of carbon that doesn't even start to consider the cost of retaining those nutrients in the soil so that's just something just something to think about is it's never there's um, it's, it's not um, it's never something that's payment for free you it's always a cost to it and just the cost may not be um, clear when you're looking at um, things like monetizing carbon there's lots of the opportunity cost of doing that so just in conclusion um, we know that our empathic variation in soil carbon and pH can be huge we know that um, GPS located sampling can increase the sensitivity of tracking any changes over time. We know that, um, well, at present, based on the information that we're able to access and the work that we did, we believe that the methods and, well, I believe that the methods and the regulation around monetizing carbon through carbon credits is high risk and high cost for farmers in Northeast Victoria and always would like to consider that the sum of the parts of soil organic matter is so much greater than just the carbon and any additional carbon that we bring into the system has so much more value than just uh, potentially a dollar value so finally i'd just like to thank jane mckinnis from rivering plains who um, did a lot of the on-ground sampling work patrick lawrence from the sustainable food lab who managed all the um, the hypercube analysis and the sampling location work and Jonathan Medway from CSU who was um, part of the project in developing up those um, those images of the maps that you saw. And just finally I'd like to flag um, something I mentioned right at the start which is the cool soil initiative which is the next phase of this work which has a greater number of partners involved and is continuing to to look at how the food industry can support cropping farmers in um, in long term sustainability and yield stability, uh, flagging that Rivering Plains, Farmlink, and Central West Farming are part of the um, part of this initial uh, initiative on, on the ground. That's great. Yeah. Thank you very much. My take home message will be about the sampling, I think, of um, the paddock. Uh, we have a few questions um, from CEO from the whole Kennetwork. Network. Research in southern South Wales shows that between pH in 10 centimetres increments and the upper soil levels doesn't highlight the level of stratification of pH occurring in the upper soil layers. And that 5 centimetre increments is now advised. Is it likely that soil carbon also has this issue? What measurement? on a finer scale and other information we are seeing right now with a zero to 10 centimetre measurement. Yeah, so definitely Karen, the zero to five centimetre increment is really pulling out the stratification pH in our systems. And I think if we looked at carbon on that level as well, we would get much greater detail. The challenge we've got, particularly in our cropping systems, is if we have any form of soil disturbance, even clotting, you know, with the time going through and busting of clods, etc., that the variance in how we measure, particularly that top um, five centimetres. So, what? How do we define what our top five centimetres is? Is I think really important. And if you get it right, then that's fantastic. Um, and I know in pasture systems where you may have um, more uniform soil surfaces, then it's 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 easier. But in a lot of the cropping systems that I, cropping paddocks that you walk through, um, you've got you've got your hilling and, and troughing according to your um, according to where the tying or dislip goes. So how to define that? So we, we had a long conversation around if we should be doing a zero to five. Um, 
but we decided that for this work we would stick with stick with standards, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that we were generally looking at that those gross changes over time. But key issue, key thing is if you've got a history of broadcasting line um, without any mixing, that the zero to ten pH value is going to overestimate your pH or increase your pH artificially compared to what you might be getting in your five to ten centimetre. So certainly, if you've never incorporated your line, do some five centimetre increments to make sure that you know exactly what you're dealing with. Another uh, question from Bob Blanken. Can the addressing of soil constraints to enable greater soil carbon storage, liming fertiliser, for example, be seen as a practice change or a uh, additive management activity? <sighs> I wish it could. Um, <laughs> to me, that's really the the key thing. Is is then we start actually recognising practice and the value of, of what we're doing to to value of carbon. But um, it's a really it's yeah it, that's a really nitty gritty thing around what's what's new and what's not. Um, so I I it'd be nice if if we could actually get some value to offset the cost of those inputs. Um, I might be wrong, but I, I don't think that's that's viable at the moment. Yeah, yeah that's from my, what I've seen and heard, I would agree with you, Cass, yeah. Um, another one from Holbrook, on the roll here, Carl Holbrook, thank you. Commonly, farmers have been advised to grid sample paddocks, zero to 10, 10 to 20. Question one, is this an approved sampling design? No. Okay. Um, the grid sampling, the grid sampling itself might be, um, but I don't know if it if it properly accounts for variance in the landscape, um, and and also the um, yeah the the depth of sampling. So a minimum sampling depth for carbon for credits is thirty centimeters, as I understand. So the surface measurements don't take that into account, um, and I don't think um, I don't think the gridding is considered best practice for sampling methods. But I'm not. That's that's not my specialty. Yeah. So the second part to that question: Can you please comment on this method of sampling versus use of NDVI with? Pattern hypo cube and plus. Sorry, Karen, you just dropped out there. I'll just see if I can find that. Um, oh, yeah. Can you please comment on the method of sampling? Yeah. Um, I think the idea of, of using the NDVI, and it's not just NDVI, it's, it's, there's always multiple ways that's needed. So we actually use radiometric data as well, which is sunlight derived, and looked at that with the, with the NDVI is the idea is that then you're um, picking up differences in the landscape or differences in soil, just differences, something is variant from there to there. Um, so I guess that way then um, you have a certain number of samples accounted for within each zone um, compared to the grid sampling, which may or may not pick that up. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd just, uh, if anyone's really interested in learning more about that, I'd direct them straight to the, there's a methodology um, paper from the um, Emission Reduction Fund on, on carbon farming, and that's got about five pages on sampling designs and protocols. It might be worthwhile sending me that. Can I consider that to everybody, please? Yep. Another question from, from Katrina. Um, what degree of difference in soil carbon would be expected to be perennial heavy pastures? Look, I'd like to think um, we should we should be getting we should be getting more. Um, we know that our deep perennials, and this is it's actually quite um, disappointing. We couldn't find a really good standard for Laris to to do with this work is that we know that um, for Phalaris to persist well and to grow well, um, soil conditions have to be pretty good. So soil constraints would be um, hopefully reduced. 
We know that um, Fularis has incredibly deep root systems and has expansive roots to depth, which by nature means that we're getting more storage of carbon at depth. We always think of carbon as in the, the top part of the plant and the, the residue that actually falls on the ground, but actually the root system can have a massive influence. And it's those deeper roots um, that stay in the soil for so much longer, so they're more confident about being classed as um, kind of sequestered carbon because as we move below 10 centimetres, we greatly reduce our microbial activity, which means that they're not going to break down quickly. So we're looking, I'm really looking forward to hopefully doing some um, decent sampling for Laris over the next year to get some guts on that one. Okay, thank you. A uh, question from Ron. If we have established pasture low pH, don't we get a good response to spreading rather than incorporating lime? So really, the, the idea with the pastures is that the only way we can incorporate lime is when we establish the pasture, like when we're going through that pasture establishment phase, really. Otherwise, we just have to put up with spreading. Um, but there's some, been some really good work coming out of the southern farming systems in southwest Victoria, demonstrating that even under their rainfall conditions, and you know, which are a lot generally a lot better than ours, um, they're still only getting movement of lime down, you know, two or three centimetres per year, if that. So really, to have an impact down to ten centimetres, you're looking at at least ten years of of lime movement, and that assumes that you've got excess lime to start with that's not going to get neutralised and, um, and um, chemically react with acid before it gets down there. So, um, yes, yeah, so there's some really good stuff coming out now showing just the level of pH acidity, acidity um, or it's low pH is in partial systems, even if they have a history of lime spreading. Okay. Uh, question from Brad. Um, some previous discussions from the Clean Energy Regulator and other supply chain. Is there, um, is there a few to have a look at that? Yeah, no, that'd be good. Now, also, um, so just flagging as well. When we looked at this work, um, I, the key thing for me was just to understand the value of carbon credits and to know just just to to know what we're dealing with, because obviously it's something of really high importance for farmers. As part of this, um, I had some conversation with uh, Mick Keoff um, from the ACCC and he was part of the, this work. And the general feeling I got was that um, when the, the system was set up, that crop, cropping systems and even to some degree um, Southeastern Australian pasture systems may or may not have been part of the consideration in that. So particularly the, the cropping sector was, was never considered to be a, a high value carbon trading enterprise. So, um, which is something that I, I, I really wish had been more discussion around when this, when this all started to see what, you know, where, where it was all sitting. But, it's really, you know, the high rainfall zone, the high, you know, permanent pastures and avoided clearing and that kind of, and the, the burning up north where it all has a big, big role to play. So I guess, I guess part of what we've tried to do in this work is really just to start managing expectations to say, well, what does the reality look like for us? And is that something that we want to start working through now or, or do we kind of hang tight to see what happens over the next five or ten years? All right, Jess, thank you very much. I don't think there's any other questions if anything comes through to me. Um, so thank you very much for your time today, Jess. Today has been recorded and will be sent to everybody that attended today and will be available on the website in about a week time, I suppose. Um, just remind you to fill in the evaluation form with according to the chat section. It's a valuable resource for us for the requirement for funding that we get to provide evaluation. Uh, if we've got no other questions, we've got a few thank yous. Thank you. I'll say goodbye to everybody now. Uh,